Hi everybody, so welcome to the channel, or welcome back to the channel, which is still about furniture from the past, of all things, namely shedding some light on it. But today we are in Paris with a little bit of a, a problem here with a piece that's in transit. It happens to be locked shut and apparently full of something, probably treasure, and so that's why we're going to open it, but we have to be very careful because this piece is not only in traffic, but this piece was probably in the first World's Fair in 1851. It is signed, it's dated in several locations, 1851, and it's made by the Italian woodcarver Angelo Barbetti, whose works at this World's Fair earned him a gold medal. Many of those works were also purchased by what is now known as the Victoria and Albert Museum. So everybody, it took us a day or two to move this upstairs. It's quite heavy, but I've now made an appointment with my friend Gérard, who is a locksmith and who's going to open the slant front portion of the desk here. And so if that doesn't yield anything though, I did check behind some of the portions that do already open and I found some secret compartments which I refuse to look at before bringing you along. So, Gérard, uh, si vous voulez bien commencer. So, Gérard just managed to open it with a metal hanger. I think that was a little too easy. I'm going to have to discuss the cost of this appointment now. <laughs> Alors... Oh. And so, unfortunately, the slant front portion of the desk, as you just discovered, it hasn't yielded any treasure yet, but Gérard actually discovered that behind the fall front here, where we have this beautiful scene from the Iliad with King Priam attempting to buy the body of his son back from Achilles here, and that's why one of Priam's servants is dumping out a treasure of gold coins here from this beautiful uh, gadrooned vase. So behind this, Mr. Soverini actually discovered that, of course, we have these little cubby holes that are wonderful. And then inside, we have some doors that give us access to an entire column of space on both sides of the piece. But I would now like to ask Mr. Soverini to come and show us, well, where we might actually find some treasure. So, si vous, si vous voulez. On a tout sorti. Et très poussiéreux d'ailleurs. So everything, everything is now completely out. Very, very dusty. Oh, uh, oui. Well, so, you know, all we have are a couple little pieces of paper, and Mr. Soverini just suggested that we look and see if there's anything written on them, perhaps, you know, the coordinates of a larger treasure. Uh, stored outside of this piece. This would just be one step in that process. Turns out there's nothing on them. Donc on a rien. Ah, oh, how the mighty have fallen. I've just been talking to myself for 10 minutes here without the microphone. But anyway, so we begin with this wonderful pediment up here with these two griffins that are holding pearls over the herald of an old and forgotten Italian family. I'm sure we'll figure out who it is with a little bit of research, but apparently they are represented by a bull, by a knight in shining armor, some sort of a phoenix, maybe just a chicken, but then we have two griffins holding a crown. And so if we move down to the rest of the piece, the first thing we see here is just some of this molding, these, these eggs and dart moldings where we have a frieze, a repetition of eggs and darts, one after another. And we're just going to appreciate how crisp that is here, even in this post-industrial era. We see that there are still pieces in the mid-19th century that are made in a way that's truly tethered to that earlier art paradigm and furniture production. And we're going to see that with just the detail and the perfection of these friezes that Angelo Barbetti, of course, sculpted out in his workshop by hand. And now, as we move down below this frieze of eggs and darts, we're going to see a frieze or a repetition of the symbols that we have already seen up here on the herald, such as the bull, the phoenix or the chicken, the knight in shining armor, and then of course the two griffins that are holding a crown. And now the most interesting part of this piece, in terms of accessing the area that was not locked shut, but just in terms of getting into this fall front here, the first writing surface, is how the keyhole is itself covered by a little plaque that says ABF. And so this means Angelo Barbetti in Florence, ABF. And so the way that you access the keyhole is not very dramatic. You simply press on the right side of it and it reveals, well, where you put the key. And it goes in upside down, which is just perfectly curious for a very unusual piece to begin with. And so you turn it 
It appears that they've already opened. And then the fall front descends, revealing the inner theater, which is really unique here in this neo-Renaissance decor here with these arches and with these three doors. And then it rests at a 45 degree angle. And at first I thought maybe something was broken with the piece that the internal mechanisms that hold it had given out. But in fact, this is where it's meant to be and it's simply easier and more comfortable to write on an angled surface. And so we have these three doors and the central drawer is carved with the name of the maker, Angelo Barbetti, as well as Florence, year 1851. And so that's our indication that this is probably a piece from the Florence exhibition in 1851. Perhaps it would be more interesting to see this as a piece from the Universal Exhibition, the World's Fair in 1851, which was, of course, the first World's Fair. But I'm going to just be a little bit more conservative in the attribution, and let's just say that this is probably an exhibition piece from Florence. After all, it says Florence, 1851. And so, the top part here is a drawer. Now, it hasn't been waxed in 100 years, so these are not too easy to take out. But as we continue to look for negative space and little secret compartments, one of the first and most interesting sort of ingenious little parts of this piece is the hole we're going to see right there. And so this is actually because behind the middle door, we can push a lever which would actually lock this drawer when it's shut. And so that would be very hard to find if you didn't know about it. And you could probably spend a lot of time pulling on this thing, trying to get it to come out, without realizing that it's locked from a hidden location. And so, as I put this drawer back in, we're going to notice how the whole drawer is in of itself made out of solid walnut. Now that's just a sign of quality. A lot of times, most of these drawers are going to be made in oak or pine or a cheaper wood, and it's just the facade that'll be used in a more noble wood. But on exhibition pieces, they would tend to make all of the piece out of, a, out of a very fine wood. And so, we'll put that back very carefully, as usual, extremely carefully, even though it's dry and it hasn't been waxed in ages. Now the same goes for the bottom drawer, which also features a little lever which will lock it. And so if we pull this out, you're going to notice a hole in the top of the drawer which corresponds to the lever inside of this door that would lock the drawer. And so, something that really caught my eye about this piece is that if you open the right door and you look inside, you will see another hidden door built into the side, which is, you know, not exactly easy to see. And just at the right angle, if you hold the door correctly, this door will open, giving you access to a whole column of space inside the piece, which corresponds to what's behind this part. So, both here and on the other side, you have a door which would open and which would allow you to access maybe some sort of rolled up scroll or parchment or God knows what you would keep in there. So the fact that the whole inner theater can be removed as its own compartment, giving you full access to a large hidden space, that completely went over my head. I'm very thankful for Mr. Soverini. And so now let's just close this top fall front here. You should always remember to lock these pieces when you have them closed, because then they can't open spontaneously. And plus, all of these secretaries with such large pieces of wood here, they tend to be slightly warped, and so sometimes the keyholes don't align very well and you need to lock them twice. So anyway, that is now locked. Now let's take a moment to appreciate the outside of the piece with these cascades of fruit, these wonderful neo-Renaissance friezes that we're gonna see decorating the sides, vertical friezes. And if we move down to the middle of the piece, we're going to see a continuation of these friezes of eggs and darts, and we're going to see these rosaces that continue all around the front of the piece. And then we should also pause to just appreciate the sculpture, this beautiful sculpture work, which now does open, thank you to Mr. Souverini, who left, he went that way. <laughs> and then here we have a drawer, which is, like the rest of the piece, extremely dry. And if we move down to the bottom compartment, we're going to notice just how dusty these mythological creatures are here as they hold up the writing surface, the, the secrétaire de pente, the slant front desk. And that just shows that this piece really was sort of sitting in a forgotten mode somewhere in some attic, actually a place in Angers where I found it. But nevertheless, it's still beautiful despite the dust, and for now I find the dust pretty charming. And it's underneath the dust inside of this compartment that we're going to see what is perhaps the only label left of Angelo Barbetti's workshop, his former headquarters in Florence. And so we wipe the dust away and we see that it says 
an Italian woodcarver. Intaglatore, I think. Anyway, I don't speak Italian very well. But there you have it. Perhaps the only trace, the only label of Angelo Barbetti that uh, is, is known. I find that to be a nice little morsel of history. And then we have quite a lot of dust in here, which I haven't decided what to do with. I find it very charming, very original. Keeps the piece, uh, you know, dans son jus, as the French say. It's still in its own juice. I don't know where that comes from. I'll have to do some research as a figure of speech. But anyway, as per tradition, the final thing we're going to do is pan over the back of the piece, which normally would sort of show you on a period piece how the backs are left rough. But here we're in the 19th century. We're, we're after that onset of industrialization. So in any case, the backs are quite smooth with regard or in comparison to 18th century pieces. But what's so interesting about this piece, this exhibition quality piece, is that not only is the back finished, while not being finished enough to truly be a middle of the room piece, it would make no sense to have this in the middle of the room, but because it's an exhibition piece, he really went to a lot of trouble to finish the back, and then very most unusually, he actually continued this frieze of eggs and darts along the back of the piece. I believe the frieze of dentals as well, and the little frieze of lamb's tongues that runs across the front. Although that's not the most interesting part of the piece, it is perhaps the most unusual because we see something that is finished evoking a middle of the room piece, while at the same time we can clearly see that there's a big gap that's in this panel and that it's not at all intended to be in the middle of the room. But it is fascinating to see just the level of care and workmanship that goes into an exhibition quality piece, such that even the never seen, completely useless back parts of the piece are going to be finished as beautifully as possible. And so this piece will forever demonstrate that. It's forever a wonderful trace of this now somewhat forgotten sculptor, Angelo Barbetti, whose works do live on in a lot of mansions on the East Coast in the United States, where he did a lot of very wonderful neo-Renaissance interior decor. Ironically enough, the building we're in here in Paris is neo-Renaissance in the other room. This room is sort of an amalgamation of French 18th century in terms of its interior architecture and design. But we see right over there the neo-Renaissance room, which is, you know, exactly what the 19th century was going through in this phase. It was this sort of fantastic reinterpretation of the Renaissance, and that was all the rage to, to do your home as if you were some Renaissance lord, even though, you know, those days were, were more than gone. So, as usual, I do hope that you've enjoyed taking a closer look at this piece. And if you'd like to support the endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of all of the pieces that I encounter, if you've liked the videos, please subscribe to the channel. It would be much appreciated. Thank you.